for weather fronts that come in from the Pacific. So here you have a photo of this man who is a retired federal wildlife biologist and a water specialist. Lab tests from Northern California show very high levels of aluminum and barium in soil and pond water. Francis Mangles told me that at 100 micrograms per liter when he was working for the um, federal government, you were shut down, 100 micro, I'm sorry, 1,000 micrograms per liter. So I asked him what normal is, what's tolerable, and he said 5 tenths. 0.5 micrograms per liter is considered normal. So here you have the findings from pond water in Mount Shasta. You can see 12,000 micrograms per liter. UG is short for microgram, which is 24,000 times normal. Snow drift at 8,000 feet, 61,100 micrograms per liter, way, way past normal. And here you have a lined pond. So please picture a lined pond, a pond with a liner, vinyl something, in Bella Vista. And you got a, a reading, or the person who did this, I know him, Dane Wigington, got a reading, 375,000 micrograms per liter in this little pond. Mangles has, a ma I will repeat, a master's of science in water-related subjects. And he also reports that a house, um, the soil tested outside this house in Northern California was 3,000 times, 3,000 micrograms per, of aluminum more than the soil under the house. I'm sorry, I said 3,000 times. Anyway, so what does this mean? It means that something is dropping from above and is affecting the soil around the house but not underneath it. So you can't say that this is in the groundwater. You can't say this is in the earth itself coming from the earth. It's got to be coming from the environment. The dying of the trees. I've spoken to Charles Little. He's the author of this absolutely fantastic book, which you can buy still by um, going to half.com or Amazon used books. It is about the natural or biotic reasons for tree death, and also the effects of industry and deforestation, which began decades ago, when manufacturing exploded, acid rain, different forms of pollution started to affect trees. But what has come along since this book was written is this. Nowadays, we have an effect coming out of the environment that can't possibly be natural. Look at this corkscrew. I took this picture myself. This is the wine opener style. You have nature trying to cope with the introduction of new substances, particularly metallic oxides, which are also the metallic salts. Living things, as I said before, um, the metallic salts have an affinity for water, so living things take up these salts along with the water that they're seeking. The natural world, which gets its food from the ground, is sucking this stuff up. This is a scraggly pine tree outside the post office in Cardiff, California, where I go every day. And you can see how brittle it is, lots of needles lost. If you look closely at the needles when you stand under the tree, you see that they're all frosted with brown. Signs of tree death are these sagging limbs, these leafless, scraggly branches. You also see infestation by bugs, insects, mites, fungus. These are spider mites that have taken up in a tree that was right next to my house. The entire tree had to be felled because of these white webs in it that were killing off the tree. But again, I'll explain why in a minute. This isn't the primary source of the death. Here you have a phenomenon that Deborah Whitman, who's here with us today, has done a lot of research on. Um, the white, we call it the tube sock effect on trees. You see white bark. And when we tested the bark of this tree, it showed it had these readings, aluminum 387. Now this is milligrams per kilogram because this is a mass analysis rather than a liquid um, uh, liquid context. So you have barium at 18.4, strontium 113, and titanium 15.2.
You can see again in these uh, photos the enormous scorched look. That's a very dying, very unhealthy tree. And you see this other thing called secondary growth. The tufts on the trunk poking out, that's the tree giving itself, desperately trying to give itself a second stab at life. So when you look around you and you see these little growths, sometimes they're all the way along the trunk from the ground up. The beauty of an induced problem is that its twin is the solution. As nature begins to die, we will be told that science will have to step in to save it. So, you'll have GMO trees as the answer. The silent forest, they call it, genetically engineered trees, non-reproductive, no fruit, nuts, blossoms, no insects, animals, birds, low lignin, that's the wood um, fiber, which makes the tree very easy to cut and pulp. The silent forest will grow straight and tall and will be replenished by the state in what will be considered appropriate numbers and in appropriate locations. In May 2010, from this article, we learned that the USDA approved large-scale field trials of 200,000 GMO eucalyptus trees made by ArborGen, a biotech company, to be planted from Florida to Texas. Now, we're told that the purpose of the trial planting is to evaluate whether such GM trees can become new sources of wood for paper and biofuels, also in the name of conservation and improvement. This is the story they give us. We're trying to conserve. We're trying to go green. We're trying to help. But then you come in, up against articles like this, 2008. This was from something called the MIT Technology Review an article announcing biochemistry's development of toxicity-resistant crops. In particular, in this article, aluminum-resistant um, plants. So the article tells us that aluminum in soil stunts the growth of crops. Wheat, corn, and barley don't fare well in aluminum-laden soils. But now, scientists, plant scientists, have found a way to get the plant to shut down its own cell division to, sorry, to stop the plant from shutting down its own cell division. Because when a plant encounters toxins in the soil, it says to itself, I don't want to keep growing. So it shuts down the cell division. But they have figured out a way to keep prompting those plants to produce um, reproduction. So this is a gene mutation, a single gene mutation, that inactivates a protein so that the plant continues to grow. The quote from this article is very interesting. The plant is effectively blind to what's happening in the cell. And that's from biochemist Paul Larson. The mutant plants can maintain high levels of growth in the presence of toxic levels of aluminum, even if they sustain DNA damage. When something begins to die in nature, it attracts bugs, blight, molds, even viruses and bacteria. This is nature's way of hastening decomposition so that the dying form can become food for other living things. Today, we have an epidemic of tree decline all over the world, not just in America, but it's in Australia, it's in Europe. Thousands of square miles of die-off in the savannas and forests of many, many continents. And in cities and suburbs, trees are rotting as they stand, swooning, breaking. They are hazards to property requiring removal. Six trees around my house have been taken out in the last two years. Sunlight is a natural disinfectant. As hazy skies limit the sunlight, molds and fungus grow. As plants that are taking up toxins struggle to live, molds, viruses, bacteria begin to take them over. This is all part of nature, and bioremediation will be the obvious answer. Metallic salts have made our air conductive. This means that we and everything around us can transmit and propagate energy. The air is no longer neutral. It no longer supports, in a healthy way, living things. 
The second group of materials found in these environmental samples is unidentifiable fibers. And I really want you to appreciate the meaning of unidentifiable. These fibers have been sent to sophisticated laboratories, and there is nothing, nothing in the databases that match them. So these are fibers, we could say, that do not exist in nature. People around the world are developing lesions on their skin that ooze and produce fibers. This is known as Morgellons syndrome. Tissue samples cultured from ordinary people without this ailment contain and grow the very same fibers. Here's a five-inch lesion on a woman's body that has never healed, five inches. The fibers or filaments are actually tubules with hollow insides. When these fibers are cultured, they produce colonies of filaments. You can see the extension filaments. And these colonies continue to grow and reproduce, branching out into more filaments and more colonies. The filament cultures can be grown from saliva samples, tissue from the skin, mucus, urine, blood. From animals and people, regardless of the presence of the Morgellons condition, the fibers are segmented with visible structures inside them. So where do these fibers or filaments come from? Airborne environmental samples that were collected by Clifford Carnicom, he is a researcher in this subject, in 2000, the year 2000, gathered at high altitude on a mountain in New Mexico, showed the presence of those fibers whose structure matches exactly the tubular filaments. When I say fibers and filaments, basically interchangeable, showing up in our blood, tissues, and skin. Additionally, the samples collected by Mr. Carnicum showed what he calls, and was called in biology, desiccated erythrocytes. This is a multisyllabic term, but it means dried red blood cells. So why these were in the air? Why are dried red blood cells in the air? Very puzzling. A medical microscopist, a biologist um, specializing in microscopy, confirmed to him that they were human red blood cells but that they had been engineered in some way so as to be preserved. So again, you have to ask yourself, if I were five years old, I would say, Mommy, what are red blood cells doing falling out of the sky? 